we have to read it, right? Yes, Rangata. So, Achana Di, you start reading today. Ha, okay, Rangata. Against this change of suppression and immobilization, nature in the individual reacts. It may react by an isolated resistance ranging from the instinctive and brutal revolt of the criminal to the complete negation of the solitary and ascetic. It may react by the assertion of an individualistic trend in the social idea, may impose it on the mass consciousness and establish a compromise between the individual and the social demand. But a compromise is not a solution. It only shares the difficulty and in the end increases the complexity of the problem and multiplies its issues. A new principle has to be called in other and higher than the two conflicting instincts and powerful at once to override and to reconcile them. Above the natural individual law, which sets up as our one standard of conduct, the satisfaction of our individual needs, preferences and desires, and the natural communal law, communal law, which sets up as a superior standard the satisfaction of the needs, preferences and desires of the community as a whole, there had to arise the notion of an ideal moral law, which is not the satisfaction of need and desire, but controls and even coerces or annuls them in the interest of an ideal order that is not animal, not vital and physical, but mental. A creation of the mind speaking for life and knowledge and right rule and right movement and true order. The moment this notion becomes powerful in man, he begins to escape from the engrossing vital and material into the mental life. He climbs from the first to the second degree of the threefold ascent of nature. He needs and desires themselves, or his needs and desires themselves are touched with a more elevated light of purpose and the mental needs, the aesthetic, intellectual and emotional desire begin to predominate over the demand of the physical and vital nature. Standards of conduct, and now Swamda is slowly now going to the third standard of conduct, morality and ethics. Okay, so we'll do the, we'll read it and we'll see what is <clears throat> Also in this para, there's a very interesting um, problem of deciphering Sri Aurobindo's uh, uh, handwriting. Okay, so we'll see that. It's very interesting because when you are reading Sri Aurobindo's manuscripts, you have to be very sure that what he has done is uh, right. And sometimes his handwriting is not very clear. So I'll give you a very interesting example of this one in this paragraph. So what's he saying? The first law of conduct is the ego. See, what you need, your needs and your desires, you have to fulfill. That's the only way you can develop yourself. If you suppress yourself, you are not going to develop yourself. So for development, you have to widen yourself. And widening means you have to use whatever your needs and whatever your desire, you have to satisfy them. That's valid at that level. Okay? It starts at the animal level and goes on to the primary behavior of human behavior in the early stages of mankind. So, but naturally, if you are going to use your egoistic desires and all that, you are going to step on your neighbor's toes and he is going to react. Okay, you can't play music at 12 o'clock at night, he is going to object. You can't um, do so many things which he will object. You can't park your car in front of his house. So, there are so many things like that. So, society steps in and makes laws. That's the second. Second standard of conduct. But the society steps in and it can step in in a very aggressive manner. It can start suppressing the freedom of the individual. In any case, so society does suppress the freedom of the individual, sometimes salutary manner, that means to say in a beneficial manner, but sometimes also not in so beneficial a manner. It depends on the individual. Suppose you very simple example, the traffic light turns red and the law is telling you, social law is telling you, you can't cross. Because that's a beneficial, it's beneficial to everybody, including you. Otherwise, you will have an accident. Now, 
But the other thing is that you have to pay your taxes. Okay, that is beneficial for society, but not so beneficial for the individual. You will be losing money. Okay, so these things. So sometimes that's exactly what we are discussing now. Against this danger of suppression and immobilization, immobilizing suppression of what individual freedom. Okay, against this danger of suppression and immobilization of individual freedom. Nature in the individual reacts naturally because there are people who want to who want to pay taxes, so he reacts. Okay. Now this is very interesting. How same to say how the individual reacts in so many ways. Okay, very interesting. It may react by an isolated resistance ranging from the instinctive and brutal revolt of the criminal. With the complete negation of his solidarity and ascetic, Sherda has covered a huge area of revolt against society, and he is clubbing the first at the lowest level. He is saying even the criminal, when he is murdering or stealing, he is revolting against society. Maybe he is a very poor man, and he needs to supply himself with some material and some money. So, from his individual point of view, he is quite right in um, even stealing or even murdering his enemy, because from his in individual point of view, but from the social point of view, it's a crime. So he has to be suppressed. So this suppression doesn't usually always work very well, and so they revolt. The taxpayer is avoiding his taxes. The uh, the murderer is. Uh, Getting rid of his opposition, this is what is happening. So, nature reacts. Nature and the individual reacts. How he is saying this, and even the solitary and the ascetic is reacting. How by leaving society. So he wants to do certain things, but they won't allow him. Okay, for instance, very simple. There are many things he wants to do, but they will not allow him. Suppose the tantric wants to have free sex as an experiment, society will not allow. So he will go away. He is revolting. And what about the one who wants to? Suppose he want a person wants to fast. I want to fast for 21 days. His family is going to obviously say, no, no, don't do that. There is danger of uh, you are uh, even dying. So don't do that. So he wants to get rid of all social pressures, family pressures, and all. He wants to be free. That's what Sri Mukti is saying. I am giving very simple examples. So. <clears throat> And so he goes away to the mountain or the cave or the forest. It may react by the assertion of the individualistic trend in the social idea. Okay. May impose it on the mass consciousness and establish a compromise between the individual and the social demand. So now, so they are introducing another one. Okay. It may react by the assertion of an Individualistic trend in the social idea may okay. impose it. For instance, in India, okay, uh, Nehru decided that India would be a mixed economy, okay, uh, which Nehru would not have agreed to, okay, because mixed economy means all the big industries, uh, steel industry, telephone industries, railways, all this will be under the central government. It will not be private. But we know from experience now that it never works because corruption sets in. So we know that that doesn't work. So, <clears throat> in fact, that is the reason why capitalistic countries develop so fast. And that was also interesting because it is based on desire. I want success quickly, and I am allowed by the government to establish a steel mill. I'll do that as fast as I can. So naturally, the economy benefits. So this is what Swami is saying. Okay, it may react by the assertion of the individualistic trend in the social life, may impose it on the mass consciousness and establish a compromise between the individual and social demand. But a compromise is not a solution. It only achana the red shells, right? But I have got salves, S A L V E S. Now this is a problem. Of the reading of Sri Ramakrishna's manuscript, and this problem will come many times. But this is a very good example. Now, see the one who is reading. Look at the two words. 
shells and cells. It is so, so, so similar. It begins with an S and there's an L in both, there's a B in both. Okay? And there's an S at the end also. In both the words, shells and cells. And both make him understand sense. There is nothing to do with the, the subject, but a very interesting problem we used to face in the archives. So just see, shells means it is not able to find a solution, so it puts it away for future use. You know that, no? When a bureaucrat cannot solve a problem, he just takes a file and puts it in the shelf. So that is called shell. He is in shelves. Okay? He puts it in the shelf. I'll deal with it later. But these other words, salves over the difficulty also is very interesting because as all doctors know, a salve is a, an ointment which you put on the body or body part. Okay? So what are you doing? You are giving only a temporary solution. <laughs> it's not a permanent solution. So it only salves over the difficulty. See how interesting. No? <laughs> and both the words make sense. So finally they decided in the archive that it is salves and not shelves. <laughs> okay, so this is, I have salves. I told you it's a very interesting problem. Many other places also I've seen similar problems. Very difficult. Two words and both fit. Both are fitting. So you have to go very carefully back to some of those um, manuscripts and see with a magnifying glass how it <laughs> whether it is shelves or salves. Okay. Anyway. So, I come back to the text. It only solves over the difficulty and in the end increases the complexity of the problem and multiplies its issues. What is he talking about? What is the difficulty? The difficulty of the freedom of the individual plus discipline and order and law in society. These two are opposites and they can never be reconciled properly unless everybody changes their attitude. You get rid of ego, and you get rid of ignorance, then there will be no problem. Because if ego is not there, I will not see anybody as my enemy. I will not see anybody as my opponent. So there will be absolutely in a supermental race that this problem will be solved. Many problems will get solved only at that level. In the physical world, you will never be able to solve this problem with the dualities. Okay? So that's what he is telling us. Compromise is not a solution. It only solves the difficulty in the end and increases the complexity of the problem and multiplies its issues. Now, China is facing a lot of problems because they are a very collective society and but they have also allowed uh, they have allowed also uh, individual enterprise. That's why they were they became so rich. Okay, but now they are. Uh, finding that the individual enterprises have succeeded are against the government. So the government is clamping down on them again. So it's not a solution. That's exactly what you are finding out. Okay? <coughs> Compromise is never a solution. Okay. I read the next one. The next sentence. A new principle has to be called in other and higher than the two conflicting instincts. The instinct of individual freedom and the instinct of order and law and harmony in society. Two conflicting instincts and powerful at once to override and to reconcile them. So what is the new principle? Now he brings in morality, ethics. Above the natural individual law, which sets up as our one standard of conduct, the satisfaction of the individual needs, law one, the first law, natural individual law of the ego sets up as our one standard of conduct, the satisfaction of our individual needs, preferences and desires, and the natural communal law, the second law, which sets up as a superior standard, the satisfaction of the needs, preferences, desires of the community. Okay? Both are ego. The individual also has an ego and the community also has an ego. And the communal ego says, I come first. Okay? So now, eh, the solution has to be found. There had to arise, their natural mission is saying, is bound to happen. There had to arise the notion of an ideal moral law, which is not the satisfaction of need and desire, but controls and even coerces or annuls them 
in the interest of the ideal order that is not animal, not vital and physical, but mental. The ideal order will be mental, not animal or vital or physical, but mental. A creation of the mind seeking for life and knowledge and right rule and right movement and true order. What is saying is very interesting because there is a harmony even at the vital level and even at the physical level. Okay. He has discussed that in the earlier paragraph, if you remember. There is a, the, uh, the bees and the ants, okay, they are at a very low level, they are not at a mental level at all. But they, there is a harmony and they work all in tandem. They work in perfect harmony. At that level. So, so he's saying not that one, but mental. Okay? He's saying in the interest of the ideal order, now the ideal order in the insect world is something different. But now he's saying it has to be something in the mental order. Okay? So that's what he's saying. And so what does he do? The mental law, the vital, the, sorry, the moral law says the only way is to reduce your or even Get rid of them. Get rid of what? Need and desire. So, it has to control the needs and desires or even coerce them. Get rid of them. Or even analyze them. So, three things will be saying. Either you control your ego or you coerce it, force it to become less. Or you completely get rid of it. Anal. Okay? See the gradation. As usual, Shemur's text is so comprehensive. He gives you all the three levels. First of all, you control it. Control your greed, control your desires. There's a limit to it. Then you can, if you, you can't control it, force it. Force it to remain silent. Or even if you can, get rid of it altogether. And I'll them. In the interest of ideal order, that is not animal, not vital and not physical. So he is comparing with the Relative harmony in the animal world. Okay? Not vital. But a mental, a creation of the mind seeking for life and knowledge and right food and right movement and true order. Now, this I can give you an example of the coercing also. For, for instance, and there is a problem even in the course. <clears throat> I want to, I am the government, and I want to build a, a highway, okay, which will uh, make uh, traffic very easy between. Chennai and Bangalore. But when I'm trying to build this highway, there are private properties that I have to take over. And the private uh, owner of the property will say, no, I won't give you. Okay. This problem has come up in Orville also. <laughs> okay. So, um, what do you do? The government enacts a law and says, for the interest of national interest, you have to give your land. We'll give you a compensation. But a compensation is never enough. Okay. So, okay. So that's one example of coercing. You force them to give the land back to you. And annul. Okay? In dictatorships, you completely annul the need and the desire of the individual. So, the moment this notion becomes powerful in man, he begins to escape from the engrossing vital and material into the mental life. Now he is saying something very interesting. I don't know how many of you remember. He climbs from the first to the second degree of the threefold ascent of nature. Okay? Now do you remember the threefold ascent of nature? Very, very early in the synthesis, he has spoken about the threefold light. One of the chapters is threefold light. And what are they? The first is the physical vital light. The normal life that man lives. The second is a mental life. And the third is a spiritual life. So this person is saying now, he has gone back to see the harmonic structure of his book. Okay. He is going back to 25 chapters before. So his thinking is absolutely not a haphazard collection of separate ideas, but a whole structure. It is so, so hmm, synthetic. He has gone to hold such and he is exposing his ideas one by one. So, the threefold life. The first one is the physical, vital life. 
Second is the mental and the third is the spiritual. And he has given the characteristics of all of them, if you remember. Okay? The law of the first law of vital physical uh, life is maintenance, okay? preservation. Okay? Preservation of tradition, preservation of your habits, preservation of customs. That's a preservation. That's no, no change. They don't want any change. The second, I am just summarizing again to you the old chapter. The second level of the mental is you want change, you want progress, you don't want a static condition. Okay? This is the energy of the mental life. You want progress, you want change, you want movement, not static condition. Then the spiritual is the seeking for the light. Okay? That's the last. You again go back to stability. You want a stable, but you want this and the highest stable, not the lowest stable. You want the Brahmic consciousness, which is absolutely static, because it's perfect. Even there, there is a gradation, but this is what we said. So, I just give you a hint of what we said in the earlier one. Okay, so, he climbs from the first to the second degree of the threefold ascent of nature. His needs and desires themselves are touched with a more elevated life and purpose and the mental need, the aesthetic, individual, intellectual and emotional desire begin to predominate over the demand of the physical and vital nature. The individual at level one is always seeking for food and sleep and sex and pleasure okay, and pleasantness. But the, at the mental level also, he has desires. But his desire is now for knowledge, for beauty, for light, for en en enlightenment. Basically, so the desire of the lower is now being turned to the desire of the higher. So it's the third law. The third law. Not that it works very well, but that's the third law. Okay? So, very interesting gradation shape that is given us. Now we go to the next one. Archana, they read. So now we, how big is the parrot? We have got time. So, okay, we will read. And Shilpa can read the last one. Uh, the natural law of conduct. The natural law of conduct proceeds from a conflict to an equilibrium of forces, impression, and desires. The higher ethical law proceeds by the development of the mental and moral nature towards a fixed internal standard or, or else a self-formed ideal of absolute qualities, justice, righteousness, love, right reason, right power, beauty, light. It is therefore essentially an individual standard. It is not a creation of the mass mind. The thinker is the individual. It is he who calls out and throws into forms that which would otherwise remain subconscious in the amorphous human whole. The motor driver is also the individual, self-discipline, not under the yoke of an outer law, but in obedience to an integral light, is essentially an individual effort. But by posting by positing his personal standard as the, translate, as the translation of an absolute moral ideal, the thinker imposes it not on, himself, not on himself alone, but on all the individuals whom his thought can reach and penetrate. And as the mass of individuals come more and more to come more and more to accept it, to accept it in idea if only in an imperfect practice or no practice, society also is compelled to obey the new orientation. It observes the ideative influ influence and tries, not with any striking su success, to mold its intuitions into new forms touched by these higher, higher ideas. But always its instinct is to translate them into binding law into pattern forms, into, into mechanic custom, into an external social compulsion upon its living unit. Okay, very interesting. Uh, paragraph, what he's saying? It's a moral law, okay? Third law, 
and then moral law. And then the fourth one is a spiritual law. In fact, there is no law at all, spiritual freedom. So, which is there? We will come to that later. Right now, he is discussing the moral law. The natural law of conduct proceeds from a conflict to an equilibrium of forces, impulsions, and desires. The natural law of conduct proceeds from a conflict of conflict, the conflict of society and individual to an equilibrium of forces, impulsions, and desires. In the third level, there is an equilibrium. You okay? Keep, keep your desires and your needs, but turn them higher. Okay. So it is a slightly equilibrium. Okay. So you are allowed some of your forces, your desires and needs, but it is better that they go upwards and not downwards. The higher ethical law proceeds by the development of the mental and moral nature towards a fixed internal standard. Not the word fixed. All morality is very, very fixed, okay? You cannot tell a lie. You cannot hurt somebody else. You cannot kill somebody else. Very, very fixed standards. In the spiritual life, these fixed standards are not applicable at all. 90% they may be applicable, but not always, okay? So, the morality is always fixed, okay? You must tell the truth, okay? So, this binds you down to their own ideas. Fixed idea. So fixed internal standard. It's not an external standard. The fixed external standard would be the social law. Okay? Obey the traffic lights. <laughs> okay. I'll come back always. Very easy to understand that one. Fixed internal standard. Or else a self-formed ideal of absolute quality. When man starts thinking with his mind, and go to ideal qualities, he thinks of justice. Okay. It is force is not. The jungle law won't do. There has to be justice. There has to be righteousness. There has to be love and not quarrel and not war. There should be right reason, not the reason being used in the wrong way. Right power. There is a wrong power and a right power also. The power also should be used in the right way. Beauty and light. Okay, so even bright beauty also is there. Bright beauty, okay, take literature, take art, okay, and but uh, wrong beauty would be the music which goes absolutely wrong, okay. Music is supposed to give you pleasure, but it starts becoming vital, and we have this jazz and rock and uh, Metal and whatnot, all they are absolutely going to the wrong, wrong beauty okay? and wrong light also. Wrong light, very interesting. Okay, knowledge. Knowledge can be used also for the wrong purpose. Dynamite. You find out that there is a, there is a law which allows you to blow up things, okay, explosion. So you can use that in the right way, you can use that in the wrong way. So uh, that's why Shendi use the word right. If he doesn't use the word right, it will remain a little vague. So he is saying very correctly. Right reason, right power. He is not repeating right. Right beauty, right light. It is therefore essentially an individual standard. It is not a creation of the mass mind. Morality is made by the individual. The thinker is the individual. It is he who calls out and throws into forms that which would otherwise remain subconscious in the amorphous human whole. Now, this is very interesting because social laws, there is usually nothing very moral about them. There is no right, there is no good or bad about it. Okay? When you are told to obey the traffic laws, there is nothing good or bad about it. It is just a law. It is a neutral law. But now morality comes in and idea of good and bad comes in. The moral standard, the striver, is also the individual. Self-discipline, not under the yoke of an outer law. I must discipline myself for my own benefit. If I don't discipline myself, I will not be able to develop myself. So, self-discipline is a moral. Not the yoke of an outer law. That is the reason why punishment is really not of much use. Some extent will control and even coerce, but it will never be the 
individual has to discover for himself what is the right and what is the wrong. So the moral cycle of the individual self discipline, not under the yoke of an outer law, but in obedience to the internal light. He has to realize that he has to change his needs and desires. <laughs> he is essentially an individual. But there is a but now. Okay, by his positing his personal standard as a translation of an absolute moral ideal, the thinker imposes it not on himself alone, but on all individuals whom his thought can reach and penetrate. So the individual who is a mental person and thinks that I should discipline myself, then he thinks automatically that everybody should do the same. Okay. And this is again a very wrong. That's why the morality is not a final standard. You have to go to the spiritual standard. The moral standard is very often this: what I think is right, okay, so, and you impose it on others. And those who are willing to accept it, they accept it. But then it always work. That's what James is going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> Essentially, an individual, but by positing his personal standard as a translation. Of an absolute moral idea, there is no change. It is absolute. Okay, you can't lie. You have to tell the truth. Does it work in the world? No, it will never work for you. The thinker imposes it not on himself alone, but on all the individuals whom his thought can reach and penetrate. And as a mass of individuals whom his thought can reach and penetrate. And as the mass of individuals come more and more to accept it, in idea, if only in an imperfect practice or no practice at all. Okay, so that's what in the we'll discuss that. Society also is compelled to obey the new orientation. You are imposing your fixed ideas on people, and you it doesn't work very well. So somebody is saying that okay, he says. Um, Imperfect practice or no practice at all. There are some who say, "I'll never obey these laws. This is ridiculous. Why should I obey them?" Okay, so, society also is compelled to obey the new orientation. It absorbs the ideative influence and tries, not with any striking success. There also it tries but doesn't succeed. We have got laws against stealing and murdering, but does that stop stealing and murdering? Absolutely not. <laughs> it continues. The more society becomes rich, the murdering and the stealing increases, not decreases. <laughs> not with any striking success. Okay. So it is very mild. It is a striking success. <laughs> no, it is not even striking. It is very, very common to fail. <laughs> to mold its institutions into new forms, touched by these higher ideas, there should be. Ideal justice. There should be ideal laws. There should be ideal love. All these are the absolute ideas of morality. But always, its instinct. Whose instinct? Morality. Its instinct is to translate them into. That's our problem. Binding laws into pattern forms, into mechanic custom, into an external social compulsion upon its living units. Now, say this: you know, living units. Someone who is living, how can you impose a dead law which does not it is binding and pattern and mechanic? That means it is dead. So on a living creature, how can you put a dead law upon its living units? Now, say this: you know, about living units. Someone who is living, how can you impose a dead law which does not it is binding and pattern and mechanic? That means it is dead. So on a living creature, how can you put a dead law? That's what they are saying. But always it's interesting to translate them into binding law, a law that binds you down. You cannot tell a lie. You cannot steal. Into pattern forms, into mechanic custom, into an external social compulsion upon its living units. Who are the living units? All human beings. In slightly wider sense, also even the animal world also, but mainly living units are the individuals. Okay, thirty-four. 
So we have got six, uh, six minutes. So we can do the last one. Shilpa can read. I noticed yes. that Yasmin has joined. <laughs> but Shilpa can read the next one. We can only probably read it. Uh, so, I thought I thought there was no class, so I didn't join. Yeah, I, I also suspected as much. But then it's recorded. But I think uh, we should uh, now decide that on Darshan days, do we have a class or we don't have a class? Yeah, we can do that. Next time we'll do that. Okay. I didn't bother too much about it because we have recorded it. It's available. Okay. And it depends on individuals. For instance, Tarika and... Um, Pallavi. Yeah. Pallavi. Yeah. Pallavi could not join because they are on duty. They are controlling the crowds. <laughs> okay. That's why. In fact, they, they put it up on the chat. They said that we can't attend to them. Anyway, Yasmin, you have lost nothing. It is recorded, so no problem. Shilpa, let's read the last one. Yes. For long up to the individual has become partially free. A moral organism capable of conscious growth, aware of an inward aware of an inward life, uh, eager for eager for spiritual progress, society continues to be external in its methods. A material and economic organism mechanical more intent upon status and self-preservation than on growth and self-perfection. The greatest present triumph of the thinking and progressive individual over the instinctive and static society has been the power he has acquired by his thought, thought will to compel it or to think also to open itself to the idea of social justice and righteous communal sympathy and mutual compassion or to feel after the rule of reason rather than blind, uh, blind custom as a test of its institution and to look on the mental and moral essence of its individual as at least one essential ele element in the validity uh, of its laws, ideally at least so to consider light rather than rather than force as its sanction. So uh, moral development and not vengeance or retreat or rest restraint as the object even of its uh, penal action is becoming just possible to the communal mind. The great the greatest future stream of the thinker will come when he can persuade the individual uh, integral and the collective whole to rest their life relation and its union and stability upon a free and harmonious consent and self-adaption and shape and grown and govern the external by the internal truth rather than to confirm, rather than to constrain the inner spirit by the tyranny of the external form of structure. So uh, we have only two minutes, we can't discuss this. There are very interesting things you are saying here. So we'll do this next time. We'll redo it. We'll go through each one and we'll be talking about very interesting things. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few things which we can discuss. It's very interesting. So the language is sometimes very, uh, you know, very general. So we have to give examples to ourselves to understand what he's saying. And then it becomes very, very living what he's saying. Okay. So a long, a long after the individual has become partially free in moral organism, we will tell you, we have to go So we will do this next time. So it's now only one. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, go ahead, yes, ma'am. Can, can one say that the Parshottama is another word for transcendence? Uh, can you repeat the question? I didn't exactly catch the. Uh, can one say <clears throat> that? The transcendence ah. 
and the Parshottama are one and the same? Oh, yes and no, both. When you use the word uh, transcendent, it can mean outside the universe. Okay, but it can you can also have two ways there. If you are going to the Purushottama, then it's a transcendent, but positive transcendent. But there can also be a negative transcendent, like the Buddhism. Okay, they have transcended the universe. They have given up the universe. They have given up body mind life. They are not interested in the world, but they don't want any personal aspect of the divine. They want only the impersonal shunyam. So you can say, but you you have to keep this in mind. Okay, that the transcendent also can go in two ways. It can go positive or it can go negative. Okay, the transcendent by the the definition of the word is beyond the universe. But beyond the universe, you can go in two ways. Okay? Maybe you can go even more ways, but uh, these two are definite. So the Purushottama is the transcendent. But the transcendent is not only necessarily the Purushottama. The transcendent can also be a Shunyam. The transcendent is below, and from there one goes to the Purushottama, and one goes to the Buddhistic idea of Shunyam. Nihil. Okay? So it can be both. Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rangita. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Rangita.